certain structure. But I want to hit on two big topics today, and I don't know that we'll have time to, to go back to that topic. Um, one is forgetful and free minds. And again, I want to connect this with a construct that is of great importance in software development and functional software development. Um, and if anyone's interested in, in going into more details, I put some links in the slides that you may find interesting. And I'm going to post these and you can go to these links. But it has to do with this notion of an adjunction. And I, I want to just, it's going to be a hand wavy treatment because adjunctions are really neat topic with, uh, with all sorts of um, rigorous insights that can come from them. But I'm just going to sort of wave my hands and come in and give you a sense of where free and forgetful bunkers um, fit into that bigger picture. So Eugenia Chang in, in this chapter introduces this notion of a forgetful functor. And these also go by the name of underlying uh, functor. Does anyone remember from the chapter, what is the flavor of a forgetful functor? What, what is it? Why do we call it forgetful? What does it do? Yeah, the more structure, the less structure. And one example she gives is from monoid into sad. Which of those has more structure? A monoid or, or a, a set of its underlying uh, elements? That it is. <laughs> Which is more structure? Monoid. Monoid encodes something besides just the elements of the monoid. The monoid has elements. But what does it have beyond the elements? It has... Binary, binary operations, it is a unit, it, it, it has these structural rules, what composes, and it has to be associated, etc., and it observes this, this behavior, and it captures that structure, right? The rules of composition, and the location, the identity, given structure, and all of that, when if we map a given model into set, gets forgotten. So maybe we map a monoid with uh, which has uh, true false as its elements. So those are possible values of it. And maybe for monoidal unit, it has, well, well, we'll say first what the operation is. I'll put it in that order. Suppose the monoidal product this binary product that's associated with monoids is and. What would the monoidal unit be? What would the, the value of the unit be such that if we hit anything else with it, we get that same other thing back? True. And why true? Because if we hit true with and true, you'll get true and false and true, we'd get what? False. So if we and any any other, any element, is it true or false, with true, we get the same thing, that other element back, right? If this were false, would that be the case? No. For example, if we did false and false, we'd get true and false back. But if we did false and true, we wouldn't get true back. No, we we'd get false, right? So that can't be the minority unit of false. It, it has to be true. Mm -hmm. um, so if we had this, uh, a forgetful functor would map this to what? Mapping it into set. If the forgetful job of the forgetful functor, that's his job in life to map, map monoids into set. It's a forgetful functor. What would it map this to, this monoid? Two elements set. Two elements set, true and false. Mm -hmm. Um, there's all this monoidal structure that is for, forgotten. What's another monoid? Another monoid we discussed a lot. Numbers. Natural numbers, beautiful monoid, lovely monoid. So that's our, the elements of it. That's set of natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. And can you give me an operation? Putting these in different orders and are often uh, so I'm doing the operation first to let you think then about what the 
what the unit is based on the operation. But what's the what's the operation we might do for this? Plus, plus, yeah, good. And what would the minority unit be for plus? Zero. Right? We take plus of zero with any other element to get that other element back, right? And what would a forgetful functor in the set turn this into? Yeah, the natural elements. That, that's what it, it, and that's why it's called the underlying function. It like takes the underlying set underneath this. But it's forgotten all this in the normal structure. It's forgotten that one plus one is two. It's forgotten that one plus two is three, right? Um, and there are many other uh, you could do it with times one, you could you could do it with uh, strings and concat. And what would the unit be if it were strings and concat? It would be what? MK string, right? Um, yeah. But as she knows, not all of them forget all structure. Here, here we're kind of forgetting all of them. Right? So that's for, no, no real structure besides um, just a bunch of elements, right? Um, but sometimes we sort of lack some structure. So we turn groups into monoids. How are groups different than monoids? Our groups have an inverse for every arrow. And groups have an inverse for every arrow, but we can turn them into monoid without that inverse, right? Mm -hmm. um, or monoids into semi-groups where they're it's forgotten it's 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 forgotten its identity. <laughs> it's forgotten its unit, I should say. It's unit. It forgets that. Um it has this monoidal combination, but um it's forgotten. It doesn't have this requirement for a for a unit uh, anymore. Um, or semi group into a set, um, uh, or or a total 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 set into a, a partially ordered totally ordered set into a partially ordered set, um, etc. So there can sometimes be relaxation of some structure, and she gives this really nice one. Uh, sort of diamond shaped one where like rings can go to groups, forgets one operation, or rings can go to monoids, right? Um, and then uh, monoids or groups can go to set, and and you get this uh, uh, you get this successive uh, successive structure. Now, one thing that she doesn't really emphasize strongly, but as a um. As a, as a nod towards later later coverage, I, I want to plug, plug this, uh, get a plug on this for you. Uh, and particularly for any projects you might think about, what I'm going to talk about is, is, is one of the coolest things in uh, applied category theory and, and applications to software engineering on them is this fact that these forgetful functors um, often give rise to <clears throat> three functors. So that's not to say three are forgetful. No, no, no. It's a, if you have a forgetful, often it will have a, a free companion. And as I understand it from David Spivak, Really, three functors are defined almost, almost built into the definition is that they go along with some corresponding forgetful functor. It's not like, oh, there's lots of free, free functors and there's a certain subset that are associated with forgetful. No, it's it's that there's uh that free functors come from forgetful functors. And I'm gonna mention a few uh here, but um the first two. I'm going to emphasize a little bit more, particularly the second one in an example here. Um, so uh, within functional software development, I had mentioned earlier the sexual interest in monads. So monads are tools, um, or they're encodings of uniform algebras. They, they can allow us to express computational effects. So effects like 
having uh, uh, a partial function instead of a total function, function that may not return a value um, or could express accumulating a log or undertaking sort of side effects along with performing an otherwise pure computation. Of course, um, uh, pure computation or doing probabilistic computation or non-deterministic computation. Monads allow us to capture that. And it turns out that there's a construct of a free monad. And a free monad uh, basically allows you to um, accumulate up, instead of collapsing things down, accumulate up more and more of a kind of a, a, a set of, of operations in order. Um, and uh, and you could then interpret it in, in a number of different ways, but you have an underlying functor associated, uh, associated with them um, that can be extracted. Um, free monoids, which is the one we're going to emphasize in underlying sets. And then there's some ones involving pointed types and underlying types uh, where you have some extra structure, I believe it's to indicate like um, unknown um, value uh, and, and things called polynomial rings and, and underlying sets. So I, I want to give you the, the sense of this. And this is an incredibly cool construct. You notice I said these come in adjoint pairs. And we say that these pairs are adjoint if they're in an adjunction. So there's this concept called an adjunct. And this is really interesting, really um, uh, quite beautiful, but also very useful. And so the idea here is that we have two categories. Sometimes they turn out to be the same category like has. And that's okay, but but in many times in category theory, we have different categories. And I'm going to be describing an example here. So the idea within an adjunction is we have two different, we have two categories, C and D. Okay. And we have a pair of what are called adjoint functors between. Them. Remember, functors are structure preserving mappings between categories. And here, there's not just one going from C to D. No, there is one called the right adjoint, but there's another one going from D to C, a left adjoint, okay? And you'll notice that, well, at first blush, it might seem like the, the picture is symmetric. It's not. In both cases, as Bill uh, Bartosz Mielewski likes to emphasize, these morphisms are pointing down in each category. Do you see that? They're pointing down, down here on the left and down here on the right. And these adjoint functors, um, you know, one of them, the, the right functor goes sort of in the um, uh, in the in the, the opposite direction of those arrows. Um, uh, and uh, coming in at the bottom, I should say, and the other one goes in the opposite direction, coming in out from the, the top of them, from their, from their sources. So one goes to destination of interest here, that's what's. But, but I, I want to, that may seem arbitrary, I want to talk about why we're interested in these pairs here in just a moment. But it's asymmetric. And of great interest here is what's the left and what's the right. And John Bice has this beautiful description of adjoint functors where he he argues, you know, that uh, a right functor in an adjoint context is often restrictive, and a left is like liberal and loose. Um, uh, but we distinguish the two so that we can keep track of which it is. And there's two ways to distinguish. Number one, you can put an arrow, a big arrow, and that shows the direction of the left functor, the, the left adjoint functor, so functors left and right. Or you put a little turnstile operator, which is also called the bottom symbol, which points in the direction of the left adjoint. Okay, so whichever one is the left adjoint you want to. Now, you'll notice that I've drawn here four objects. Two objects, 
in the left category, C, which is labeled C, uh, with no privilege, and <laughs> two in the right. Um, and what's notable is uh, uh, they come in pairs where one is the image of the other uh, through one of these attributes. So D over here in category capital D, script D, is mapped through the left adjoint into LD over here in the left. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So remember, a functor maps objects to objects, right? And so this one maps D over to LD. It also maps more lessons, but just, I'm just emphasizing the objects right now. D over to LD, right? And, and then there's this object C. There could be many objects C over in category C. But for any of them, um, our, our focus will be for all possible objects C, just like it's all possible objects D and category D over all possible objects C, we have this other mapping from that object C over into the right category called RC, or R as a function. So often our interests are any C over in category C, um, and any D over in category D, there's this kind of relationship where over in category C, we have LD, these links, these, this home set from LD down to the C we chose. And over in category D, we have this, we chose uh, uh, some object D and it has, it has a home set down to the mapping of the C we chose over here, our C, okay? And this may all seem like really bizarre, like what's going on? But the point is, what we're going to see is the fundamental um, structure conservation, the, the fact that structure on the left is mirrored on the right, okay? We're going to see why this is for one case, but it's true in general that these structures, when you have an adjoint pair, these pairs that kind of go together, among them these three forgetful pairs, and they go together in this way, there's this mirroring of structure between them. It's like these two different worlds that are mirrors of each other, but not, not exactly the same, but sort of um, corresponding. Okay, now the key property that relates that is for all C and C. Remember I said, we get to pick C, we get to pick D. Hmm? Pick a C, that is Pick a D for any D. The hub set, the morphisms between LD and C. So L, you know, hit D with L and get it over here. You get LD in, in the, the, the hub set between LD and C over here in the category C, right here in the left. That hub set is isomorphic to, it's not only isomorphic, it's what's called naturally isomorphic, which is a concept we get to in our final, final, final meeting. Um, it's naturally isomorphic to the home set between whatever D we had picked and R applied to C, sort of the mapping of C over to there. So what this is, I think, is like the pick, pick any object in category C, any object in category D, there's this mirroring of structure that, that occurs between where L maps D and where R maps C. You have the same, same structure that, that these home sets on the left and the right are in one to one correspondence. And it's not merely one to one. It turns out it's, it's a stronger condition yet. It's naturally one to one. It has this extra preservation of structure, this extra well behavedness in ways we'll, we'll discuss in a later time. Um, so do you understand that? This hump set over here, and that's why I've drawn it in these colors. There's a black corresponds to black over, over on the right-hand side. The, the orange on the left corresponds to the orange. It's, it doesn't mean it's the same morphism, but it's the analog morphism. It's the corresponding morphism. Do you see that? It's the respective morphism in the other category. It may look different in its particulars, but it's the same basic, it corresponds to the other one. So C and D are like these corresponding categories, these not quite mirror worlds, but it's like, um, but very, very um, uh, tied in and corresponding. So 
Let's zoom out to free and forgetful functors and let's look at one of these examples. It's the second example of my list, three monoids and underlying sets. Are we ready to see it? Okay, okay, let's let's take a look at it. Here we go. So, so this is this is cool. Trust me, trust me. Okay. So um I'm gonna zero in on this particular case. So remember, free forgetful common pairs. They're the adjoint pairs. We're going to call the free one F, and we're going to call the forgetful one U for underlying. Okay? And F is the left adjoint. I should put that John style here too, but it's the left adjoint. Okay? As John Weiss says, it's the loose one. It's the kind of liberal one. It's the one that, that is very sort of uh, uh, allows more, more flexibility. Um, U, the right one, um, is um, sort of, uh, in this case, restricts, forgets about structure. Okay. Um, so we have monoid on the left. So this is a category of monoids on the left, and it's, a, and it's set on the right. So just to orient us, what are the objects in set? What are the objects in set? Each object is a what? In the category set, the objects are what? Sets. What are the morphisms between objects? Functions. They're functions. So over here on the right, we have a jump two sets, D and RC, where R is R C is the image through through uh I'm sorry, instead of saying R, it should say U C. I'm I'm terribly sorry. This this that's the right phone, the right adjunct. It should say U. Okay. So I'll uh, um, it should, that should be you, okay? Um, you see, okay. Um, and uh, let me, I, I, I can't resist, I'm sorry. Um, I just need to, uh, just need to remind you. So I'll, I'll say you see here, okay? And we'll put it in the next slide. So, so you're just, remember, you, you have enough to, to understand here, but um, I don't want you to get it. Terribly distracted by by uh, needing to remember what it's R. Okay, here we go. Let's. Okay, so over here, and we'll get to this. Over here on the the right, we have sets. Each object is a set, and the morphisms are what functions, functions between sets. So we have two particular sets that are focused right now: D and whatever U maps C to. Right. Over here on the left, this is the category of what? Monoids. So each object here is a what? A, a monoid. And the morphisms between monoids are what? What's the morphisms in a category of monoids? They are monohomomorphisms. These way of mapping one monoid into another that like collapse down certain operations, but do so in a way that preserves what? Unit and honors the the uh, the monoidal uh, monoidal yeah composition or, or product of, of things yeah that it maybe maybe we're turning natural numbers with plus and maybe we're mapping it for example in this and these and these ones down to a C which is you know um uh something like uh. Uh, the uh, uh, zero other two zero and one, and, uh, so mod two basically plus mod two and uh, and zero, right? So there we're mapping this plus down, and it's consistent, it's coarse grained, right? Like we no longer keep track of is it zero or is it two or is it four? Is it, all we keep track is that it's even, right? And we're adding things mod two, right? And it, but it's consistent. If we if we add things to the left and natural numbers and then map, we get the same thing as mapping first and then adding over in the right hand side. Are we comfortable with that? So these are monohomomorphisms on the left. Are we comfortable? And remember, there's many types of monoids, right? And what I'm going to tell you 
is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these maps, between sets, over here on the left, which are maps between sets are what? Oh, maps between sets are map between sets are what? Functions. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between those functions and these kind of homomorphisms. Now that's a strong statement because set has a lot of functions between them, right? Remember, set is no structure to preserve, right? I mean, in general, if we have more structure to preserve, like if these were post sets, partially ordered sets, and the maps between them, we have to honor those things, and, and there'd be fewer fun legitimate functions, right? It's not just any function. It'll be the only functions that are well behaved, right? But if it's mapped between any sets, those are, there's a lot of them, right? Remember, remember that? If we have maps from set, B to, to A, how many how many uh, of them? How many possible functions are there? Do you remember? Yeah. For for every value of B, we have another multiple of A possibilities, right? If B is one, we just have to pick one A to the one. If B is two, has two possibilities, true or false, we have to have A times A, right? If we have three possible values of B, we have to pick one A for the first, one A for the second, one A for the third, so it's A cubed. Are you okay with that? There's a lot of these functions over on the left. But what I'm telling you, what I'm submitting to, what I'm arguing to, is that those are one-to-one -one correspondence with these maps between mono and mono. These these monotones. And that's a wild statement. It's wild because monoids, do they have structure? They have a heck of a lot of structure, right? They have this whole this whole structure associated with monoidal operation, but somehow they're one-to-one -one correspondence. So somehow the monoids that correspond to these 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 Morphisms over on the right, these set morphisms, they have to be a special type of monoid. They have to be a, a monoid that, that has just huge numbers of possibilities with it, not just any. So the images of D as mapped over via this functor F over into the left, they can't just be any old tiny monoid because there'd be few things coming out of bed because there's not many possibilities of homomorphs. They have to be a very special type of a, a type of mono that remember there's lots of things on the left not mapped to by F, right? Remember, in general, functors are not surjective. So there's lots of things over here on the left, the category on the left that are not mapped to by any F, right? But the ones that are mapped to by F, I'm telling you, are particularly kind of flexible monoids. The, the monoids that have a lot of possibilities when mapping them to other monoids. And guess what monoids those are? They are the what monoids? The free monoids. Those ones have all this extra possibility. So let's go through. Can we? Can we go through this? Okay. Hearing no objections. I, I, I take it master on online doesn't object to you. Okay. Um, okay. So, so let's take an example. So remember, pick pick any C and any D. I'm going to pick some C. Okay, I'm going to pick a monoid that's up here on the board. Um, to me, this one here, true, false, true, and end. Are we okay with that? I put it the other order just to so I can get you to think about the minority unit after we chose the operation. Okay, so that's my monoid. That's a monoid, right? Um. That's not a monoid that's going to be mapped to by F, but that's fine. It's any monoid, any monoid. Pick a monoid, any monoid, right? Right? On the left, right? On the right, I'm going to pick a D. We ready? I'm going to pick the D159. Okay? I'm just going to pick one one. It could be any. Okay? One five. Okay, now, what this is saying 
in an adjunction in general is that when you have this adjoint pair, if you map D over into LD, hmm. you map C over into RC, the right adjoint. So, so oh, sorry, this should not say D, you should say F, F, F. Okay, I, I uh, okay, let me, let me, let me go fix that. Sorry, sorry, folks. Um, I, I should have been uh, more careful uh, doing this. Okay, hey, come on, get back there. Oh no, okay, come on, come on. Where, where is this? Okay, yeah. Uh, oh wait, wait, no, we still want that. Okay, sorry. Boom, boom. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, so this is. It says LD. What should it be? Oh, oh. <laughs> this L. Okay, wrong, wrong, wrong one. Okay, what should this be instead of LD? It should be what? FD. It's the map. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, at least it's entertaining, right? Um, so this should be FD. The map of F, the image of D uh, over here in Vaughn uh, as, as mapped by F. Are we okay? And I'm going to take this and I am going to put it here. Too. Are we okay? Yeah. Are we okay? Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, so, so we have this general situation, right? And what I'm saying is that we're going to explicate it with these particular values for C, this monoid on the uh, on the booleans with and. And we're going to do it with a set one five nine. So when we hit one five nine with this free functor, what are we going to get? We're going to get a what? What sort of monoid? A free monoid. This is a free functor. It's a functor mapping from set to monoid. And it creates a free model. Hmm? That's why it's going to have such, such little, so many possibilities, so many things that could map up. And what, what is the free monoid of 159 looks like? So does anyone remember? We talked about it many months ago, but or several months ago, but what, what's a free What's a free monoid? Does anyone remember? Tell me some things that are characteristics of a free monoid. Any monoid has a set. It has a some set of elements. One and, and it has, okay, I'll, I'll get to this in a minute. So any monoid has a set of elements, right? Possible values. It has, what else does any monoid have? Binary operation. Binary operation in a unit. What, what's distinguishing about a free monoid? Free monoid, and remember, free, it means we're not, we're, we're being minimally constrained. We're not, uh, there's no, um, as much as possible as allowed by the rules of categories, as allowed by the rules of monoids, things like associativity and unitality, Combining with a unit always needs to yield. If you combine any element with a unit, you get that other element back, right? If you combine, um, if you combine A and then B and then C, it has to be the same as whether you go A and B and then C or uh, A and then B and then C, right? Um, within those rules, anytime you combine two elements, you'll get a new one. Not all the time because you have to observe those rules, associativity. But you'll get a new one whenever, whenever possible. Every another way to think about it: if you think about uh, a monoid, you remember what a monoid looks like if I draw it out. A monoid in in uh, in a category, a mono. What does a, a monoid category looks like? What does it look like? How many objects does it have? One. one. Call it star. And where are the elements? They are what? More of them. So there's one hidden one that's ID on star. And then there's all these others, right? Right? Mm -hmm. 
So a free module here is basically any path through this. Um, there's as many elements in the free monoid as, as in pad through this thing, okay? Because um, every path will be distinct. And the next thing about thinking about this path is when we think about a path, we don't really think, well, if we do two first and then we do the third, is it the same as doing the first and then the next two? They're all the same. The, the, those two. So we automatically, when we think about paths, we're assuming sort of we're thinking about in an associative fashion. So it turns out that that three models for a given set, and like a given underlying set 159, um, are equivalent to, can be thought of as lists composed whose, whose elements speak of the list, whose successive values in the list. Are drawn from the set one point nine. So, and and where the monoidal operation is a pen of lists. So if you combine one element with another, it's just like appending them together in terms of the set. Remember the elements are lists. So maybe like one element is is the list one seven. Or, or here we'll we'll combine ourselves to this one five, right? One five nine. The elements are one five are drawn from one five nine. That's one element of this free model. Give me another element of the free model. I'm saying they're all lists of whose elements are one five nine. Give me another one. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Empty list. Good. Good. Um and if I append these two, what do I get back? One five. One five. If I, if I append them, I get back one five. Mm -hmm. What does that suggest? This plays the role of <laughs> identity gathering unit, unit in the model. Is that true the other way too? Do you combine on the left? Yes. Okay. So give me another element of this model. We have, we have let's say one five. Give me another one. No. Sorry, no, no, good. And if I take the monoidal operation here for these, what would I get? One five nine. Okay, give me another element of this model. Nine five. Nine five. Okay, good. Nine five. And give me another one yet. Five one. Five, five one. Okay, good. Good. And what would I get out? Nine five no. five one. Nine five five one. If there's no prescription, it, it can work them just fine. That's fine. Do, do we see this? As do you see what the monoidal operation is? It just puts them together. Now, is this associative? If you Combine one list A and another list B and another list C. Does it matter whether you stick A and B together first and then C at the end of it, or A first and then B, then B, you know, stuck together to C next? Does it matter? No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter where we kind of stuck it together, right? Um, do, do you appreciate that? Do you, do you understand that? Like if I had, um, you know, one by one, you know, the list one containing the element one with, um, you know, one, one, five, or say one, nine, just for, for, to, to not assume any sort of ordering, uh, and then with, with five, five, and I do, I do first, um, because I like to explain it this way. One with one nine. What would be the combination of one and one nine? One one nine. One one nine. And then I combine that with five five. What would I get? One, five. Yeah, one one nine five five. Um one one nine five five. Good. And if I did it in the other order, these two, 
uh, I would get one combined with what? What's the result of combining one nine and five five? Yeah, so I, I get one nine five five, and the result is what? Yeah, it's exactly the same as this, right? So, so associativity holds with the list, right? It doesn't matter which chunks we put together first, because they all go together. Do you understand that? So what I'm saying is the free monoid on 159 um, can be thought of as, as something where we just have lists of 159 and and we can you know uh sorry yeah so we're combining together these successive operations in a way that's associative in a way that's you know what we combine it with with empty list we get that same you know any any list combined with an empty list gives the other list back regardless whether it's first or second um uh and where these successive one five nine are uh, reflect these these sort of uh, successive actions in in these this mono these successive elements uh, of the mono and we're combining them together in this way as guaranteed to use those properties for the mono. Are we comfortable with that being a sort of a mono structure and being a free structure where you get a new value? Um, uh, you know, that combining things gives you new values in general, except it builds in, it's like built into it that it's associative, built in that it's unital, that it, that it, you combine anything with this, it's unital. So it, it, it has, this is the structure of a free model. We get new things wherever we can uh, within the constraints of initality and associative. You understand that, that structure? Are we okay with this? Okay, so what I'm saying is when we map 159, the set over, we get a free monoid in 159, which is basically less of these. Are we okay? Okay, now, okay, now, let's consider over on the left-hand side, uh, a, uh, so we have 1.9, and we have um, uh, that map to this free mono. Right? Now we're going to pick. So we we have picked our D. Now we have to pick our C. And I picked earlier. You remember we picked earlier uh, the monoid, the Boolean monoid, which is about the simplest I can match, right? Just for ease. Okay. What's the under? So so when I hit that with the underlying functor, the forgetful functor, what do I get? When I hit the free, this, sorry, when I hit not the free mono, but this other mono, it's not free. This this one is not free, right? It's, it's a uh, really expensive. No, it's not expensive. <laughs> oh, it's, 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 uh, it's not a free mono. It's just a regular old mono. It's not mapped to by F. It's some other object over here. But when I get its underlying set by this, by this right adjoint, this one down here, the underlying functor, the the forgetful functor, what do I get out of it? Uh, well, when I map it over to set, what do I get out? Of? I get out of a set, right? What is the set I get out? Of? True, false. True, false. True, false. It's the underlying set of the mono, the set of all elements of that mono, right? Are we okay with that? Set of all elements of the mono. Over here, true, false. Are we okay? So that's what our C is. Remember, for any C that I pick, I pick one mono. Very simple. For any D that I pick, I pick one five nine. For that D, I got this F, this F D, right? This because it needs us degrees of freedom. To, to, to have lots of these things to map up. And over here, I have a map from 159 down to true or false. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many different values, how many different functions are there from 159 down to true or false? Eight. Eight indeed. For one, we have to pick either true or false. For two, we have to pick true or false. 
For three, we have to pick up true false, right? Now, one of them we might say is odd. What do you think that's going to return for one? True. True. For five? For nine? True. Okay, good. How about is even? False, 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 right? Yes. How about is prime? So, so suppose we say one prime, we'll consider it prime. <laughs> Okay. okay. What what do we what would we get? True, true, false. false. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So we we have these snappings from one five nine down to true false, right? And what I'm saying, and what the adjunction is saying, is there's a one to one correspondence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. between these morphisms over here from one five nine to true false, and these ones over here from the three monoid down to this mark. And I'm just gonna show you what the correspondence is. I'm gonna pick one of these, the is odd one, to illustrate this, okay? So here's the deal. Okay, first of all, let's let's remember what, oh, over on the right, we have these objects are what? There's that, and one of the morphisms, function. function. Good, is odd, is even, is prime, right? They're, Determine for each value of the source set, 1.9 with the, with the values. Over on the left, what are the objects? Monoids. And what are the morphisms? Mono homomorphisms. These kind of coarse grainings of these, of these mappings union monoids that honor the structure of Bixian coarse grain, right? Remember, like we said earlier, if you go from natural numbers to, to, um, to a, to a one when you're just coming in mod two, right? Of course grains it, but it honors the structure. It doesn't contradict the original structure. Are we okay with that? These are mono homomorphisms. Okay, let's ask. Okay, well, if we have it is odd in the lab, what's the mono and homomorphism associated with this? Now this is cool. You want to see this? Do you want to see the cool of us? Okay, okay, good. I'm glad no one objects. Okay, so what I'm gonna call it fold with is odd. Okay. So it's gonna be kind of, and I'm gonna use this term kind of loosely. It's gonna be a lifting. It's it's gonna be sort of is odd adapted for the monoid world. Okay. And and I'm, I wanna wanna be specific. I'm speaking loosely there, but basically we're gonna adapt it. And what it's going to do, remember, its job in life is to map from what's this thing up here? What's what's this object up here? It's a, it's a monoid. And what sort of monoid? It's mapped to by F. So it's a free monoid, this free monoid 159 with the append in, in unit, right? Uh, for an empty string, empty uh, list is unit. And this this fold with this odd is monomorphism mapping from that to this, to this. Um, uh, Boolean uh, monoid with AND, right? Okay, so how is it going to do this? Well, okay, this modern homomorphism is going to do the following, okay? Um, remember, the source has elements 159, a list of 159. Remember that? Just right up there? Okay. It's going to be mapping each element of, of these lists for each list here. Remember, the, it's got to, got to, remember the monad homomorphism has to match, have to map each element of the source monoid with the element of the target, right? Are we okay with that? So it's got to map each of these to the target monoid in a way that honors the rules, not position. Right now, honors the monoid uh, minor product in the unit. Okay, so I'm going to say for a given list, well, uh, we're going to map, uh, suppose it has elements, we're going to map uh, each of the, for that, for that list, it's going to be composed of one, five, and nines, right? This is the elements of the list. And for each of those digits, I'm going to map it 
to a particular element of the target model, true or false. And what rule am I going to use to turn each digit into true or false? What, what rule could I possibly use? Is of. So this is going to be this gray one. It's going to be the one corresponding to is odd over here. It's the it, it's the one that that corresponds in this isomorphism, this natural isomorphism down at the bottom. It's the one that corresponds to that. This fold with is odd. So its job in life is going to take each digit, and it, so a given element. It has to have a given element of the free model, which looks like a list of one five nines, right? And how does it do it? It takes whichever one five nine, whatever of those digits it gets to for each position, and it maps it using is odd to either true or false, okay? So, so, and then what's it gonna do? It's not done yet. It's gonna and them together to get an element of this monoid, which is, and what are the elements of this monoid down here? True or false. So it's gonna map each, each of these one, one, you know, one, it's gonna map with is odd to what? True. With one, it's gonna map it to true. With nine, it's gonna map it to for five, it maps it to. But all along the way, if performing the monoidal product on which monoidal product? This one down here for the target mono and. So if and is true, and with true, and with true, and with true, and with true, and maps it to what? True. Because its job in life is to map it to a particular morphism here in a way that honors composition or you know, monoidal product um, and, and unit. So so it turns out, if you think it through, that does honor the, the monoidal product up here. The monoidal product up here in the free monoid is what? A pen. Uh -huh. and, and you can either have two elements or two lists up here and append them and then map, or you can or you can map and then take the monoidal product down here and you get the same thing. Hmm? So it doesn't, so it honors it. But we still have to show how does how do you think it handles unit? Let's suppose that map with this odd is dealing with an empty list from up here in the free monoid. Where do you think it maps it to? The unit, the unit in the target monoid, which is what? True. So its job in life is to go through and, and translate piecewise each element of the free monoid, all of its pieces, and accumulate folding them up, sort of applying the monoidal operation and the target monoid to throw them up. Um, uh, and that will honor the composition and the source, the append. You, you, again, you can. You know, Take two things and append them and then map, or take take two things, map, and then append and then you know and through them down, uh, you know, uh, and then and them down there with the monoidal product and the and the, and the target, it yields the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so that is the morphism that is in one-to-one -one correspondence with is odd. And what I'm telling you is there's a corresponding morphism for is even. Can you believe that? Just the same Utah's from things, right? The same idea. This go one goes to what with his even? False. One goes to what? Oh, false, then abandoning them up, right? How about for is prime? What does one go to? True. True. Nine. False. True. 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 And the entirety is what? False because we're amming them up and there was you know, power to one sticking on that didn't agree. So it goes to 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 false down here. Yeah. Um so so what I'm saying is each of these functions from one five down to true false has a corresponding one over here that operates in the free one. Do you see that? And so it might seem outlandish, this idea that wait a minute. Monoids are very restrictive things. They don't have 
willy-nilly homomorphisms. They're, they're, you know, they have a lot of structure to preserve. They can't afford to just say, well, whatever, um, like sets do. Sets, you know, function sets, or something. tons of them, right? But here, because we're dealing with the free monoid, it's a very voluminous monoid. It has all these lists, right? All these lists, which have all these possibilities, and that affords us this chance to have lots of these mappings. And if you went and you considered all the possible mappings, over here on the right, there'd be how many from 1.9 to true false? A. And over here on the left, there'd be A. Just apply it to hmm? So, So this is an example of how three monoids and how three structures um, here with the left adjoint um, go along with forgetful functors for the right adjoint in a way that guarantees this isomorphism. What I haven't talked about is the naturality, because that will wait for natural transfer um, to, to be able to properly deal with that. If anyone's interested in seeing more of this example, uh, I was actually um, inspired in the general idea from David Spivak's talk at Lambda Conference, um, where he has really condensed and sort of covered a lot of categorical concepts. And this is this is one of them. Um, and I just elaborated on some of this. But um, free functors give these sort of free structures that are particularly flexible and, and have um, less restriction associated with them. Whenever you can have a new element, you will, um, within the bounds of unitality and, and associativity. Whereas this other one underlying extracts things with less structure. Are we okay with that? Okay. Okay, now, so that's free monoids and underlying monoids. Yes. Yes. Can you say the right are congruent. I um I think you could could you say they're congruent? Um, um I'd have to I'd have to know the um they're certainly isomorphic. That that, that sorry, sorry, do you mean like the categories are congruent or like these these home sets? Or, because like the home sets are isomorphic, and they're not only isomorphic, they're naturally. I touched the geometric category having congruence between. Oh, um, hmm. um, and mapping and the balance. Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, we have a congruence at the left side, for example, on the right side. I wanted to know if these are going to. Yeah, uh, at the geometry uh, uh, maybe at some level, but I'm not familiar with the direct mapping. Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, it may be that that could be formalized into this. So it may be that indeed that's another example of this, but I can't say off the top of my head because I don't, I don't know the results there. We could ask someone who's a category theorist and they may be able to, to identify that. Um, but the structure comes up a huge amount. And in computer programming, these adjoints are really, uh, they, they end up popping up quite a bit. And in fact, you can find cases of these adjoints in many um, practical examples. And it could, in principle, maintain them um, in, in software. One of the things that's uh, and one way, one place that you see the Milanus with what are called Galois connections, um, uh, where you have uh, uh, post sets on both sides, partially ordered sets. Um, I will further note that um, we, it's out of adjoints that a lot of relationships uh, of relevance in computer science come up. So factors having to do with currying and uncurrying um, end up being having sort of reflections and, and um, uh, adjoint pairs, not free under or un and underlying, but in a different context. And it turns out that monads 
come out of that junction. So uh, monads um, are going to relate to uh, cases where we have um, uh, mappings uh, that that end up uh, occurring within a given category um, from say uh, uh, C to, and again, it, it, it's more commonly done with this, from C to like uh, R, R after L uh, times C. So if you map it around and then you, you end up mapping it back, um, where does it go to? And it turns out you get monads and you get co-monads out of that. And co-monads are, are really interesting structures as well. So adjoints are, are some of the coolest things in adjunctions, but are some of the co coolest things that um, you encounter. And they are directly related to some computational constructs that are of, of significance. Okay? Okay. So, so that's what I wanted to cover on free and free game. Now, um, we have an impossible task <laughs> upon us because I had wanted to cover the other topic of great significance, which is contravariant functions. Um, and this, this also is of huge import. It comes up all the time in theoretic work. Uh, and it comes up uh, quite a lot in uh, uh, the the context of many other um, other constructs like pro um, uh, or Caprici's, etc. Um, this is uh, also something which comes up in programming a lot. And I had prepared a bunch of slides and. I do have to just show those, but uh, in a triage, I'm going to have to wait to show them to you because it's really substantive stuff and it's very practical in its implication. But the idea here is that we've been talking about functors, which are what are called covariant functors. Okay. Um, and we've seen them in many contexts. We lift a function going from A to B, to example, map that maybe of A to maybe of B. Do you remember that notion? So what is, if we lift a function from A to B to operate from a maybe of, turn a maybe of A into a maybe of B, what do you think it does um, on the maybe of A? Does the function, if it's there, it does nothing. It's exactly. If, if, the, if the maybe is holding a value of type A, it applies the function to it and it gets a value of type B, right? You have this function given to us to go to A to B. If the maybe does not hold the value, if it's if it if it's nothing, guess what we get back? Nothing. Yeah. Um and and so we we can map a maybe of A over to B. And the only question is do we have the A of R, right? Right. Um, remember list functor. Um, if we have a list of A's, um, what I'm telling you is, if we have a mapping from A to B's, a function that goes from A to B, and we have a list of A, what can we turn it into? A list of B's. How do we do it? How do we turn this? If we have a function that goes from an A to a B, and we have this list of A's. How do we turn that into a list of Bs? Apply every, apply every element, right? We, we, we have these elements in the list of A, one after the other, right? They're, they're all A's. And what can we do with each of those A's? Turn it into Bs. Easy peasy, right? Okay, how about a reader functor? Um, so a reader functor, a lot of these are moments. They're all moments. <laughs> um, so the reader on an F function um, has something which we often think of as environmental. Just think of it as a fixed type for now. And given that it's a it's a mapping, it's a function 
from that fixed type to A. You give it an instance that a fixed type will give you an A. What I'm saying is, I have a function from A to B, and I have one of these things that if I give it an E, a type E, I get an A. How can I turn that into something? If I give it an E, I get a B. What could I do? It's kind of a jigsaw puzzle. If, if I have something that, that can turn an A to a B, that's given, and I have a mapping from, I have a way of turning E's into A's, what can I do? But function, I get a B, right? It's it's um, just like this, right? Um, so I I have one of these things that can turn an A into a B, and if you give me something that turns an E into an A, if that's what you give me, I can give you back something that turns an E into a B by just taking the thing you gave me, um, uh -oh, and and I'll give you back the thing that takes an E to a B by using that thing that turns an E to an A. You give me an E. I'll I'll give that to the thing that you gave me that turns an E to an A, and then I'll apply this mapping from A to B, and I'll get back a B and give it to you. And that will be my recipe for getting to an E to a B. Are we okay with that? Okay. Okay. So the idea is work. Um, uh, so we're going to be able to use this thing the person's going to give me that gives an, an E to an A. I'm going to I can have an A. And I'll be able to hit it with this F from A to B and get back a B. Do you get that? I'm going to have an A in hand. Okay, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, so I want something that goes from an E to a B, and I got this thing that can turn these into A's. So I'm going to take my E, I'm going to plug it into that machine that will get me an A, and then I'll apply F to it, and I'll get a B. Are we okay? Okay, hearing no objection. Okay, now contravariant functors are going to turn this around. The motivating example I'm going to leave you with, and we're going to pick up next time, because this is so important. There's so much good intuition to build up. But it's it's confusing the first time you see it is okay. Yes, it would be the opposite direction, but we have to understand this. So we, we were just talking about something, and I'm gonna use different letters. But if I have something that that uh can map from an S to a T, and you give me something that maps from an E to an S, hmm. I can give you back something that maps from an E to a T. And I'm, I'm trying to throw this to show the power of diagrammatic mutation, right? All I have to do is a jigsaw puzzle, right? I take this thing you give me from an E to an S. That's one of the things I'm given. I take the other thing I'm giving, which is something goes from an S to a T, I stick it on at the end, right? It's like fitting the jigsaw pieces, as Eugenia Chang says, and I got something going from E to a T. Do you see that? Okay. Now, for contravariant functors, I want to ask you this. So we just we just said that, but now suppose it's a it's a it's a twist. Okay, and instead of going having things to go e to s or e to t, um, suppose you have something goes from f to e, not not e to s, but s to e. That's suppose that term. Um, and and we want to get something that goes from t to e instead. Okay, it sounds like going from a a list of F to a list of T, or maybe a F to maybe a T, right? That's what it sounds like at first blush. A reader of S to reader of T, but it's it's different. And here's the thing: suppose I I have a function that gives it S to a T, just like I did before, right? S to a T, and I have this thing given to me that's an S to an E. Before I had E to F before, right? That's why I was able to put these together as jigsaw pieces, right? E to S, S to T, put them right up each other. Suppose now, instead of having that E to S, I have an S to E. So I'm given an S to a T, right? I've given an S to an E. Can I stick them together? Can I, can I stick them together to get an, to a T to an E? That's what I want, right? Just like I turned a list of S into a list of T, or a maybe of S to a maybe of T, 
or a reader of S to a reader of T. Um, can I do that here? No, no I can't, right? The, the jigsaw pieces don't fit, right? I, I wanna I wanna like stick the S to the T in, in front of this, but does it fit? No, because because like I, I I don't have something that gives an S, right? Um I something that I have that wants an S, but I don't have something that gives an S, so I can't stick it to the front because it produces a T. Can I stick T, it at the end? T, yeah. Can I stick it at the end here? T. No. T. Okay. Okay, okay. You're you're getting warm. So we can't, we want something that's T to E, but we want to get it. We the idea is we want to just like we mapped a list of S to a list of T by mapping this sort of function over it, just like we had a, a, a maybe of S map to a maybe of T by mapping a function from S to T. We want to do that here, but we can't. But what Nona is getting at is what we can do. So with a normal covariant functor, we, can, we can't do it. We can't actually map it. But with a contravariant functor, we can, okay? And specifically, instead of having an S to a T, that's what we had here. That's what we've had for all the previous examples, the equivalent of an S to a T. An S to a T allows us to turn a list of S into a list of T. You believe that? An S to a T allows us to turn maybe of S into a maybe of T. You get that? A list of S to T, or sorry, an S to a T allows us to turn an E, e arrow S to an E arrow T. By just post composing, doing given a E or S, I can turn that into a T, right? Um, through S to T. But given an S to T here, I can't make it. Give me an, give me, a, I, I want to get it. I have an S to E, and I want to get a, a T to an E. So I, I have a function that turns S's into E's, and I want to get a function that turns T's into E's, and I can't do it by this. But what I can do it by is if I have something that turns a T to an S. How can I do it? How can I, if, if I have this thing, a, a function that gives an S, that I, I get an S and I turn it into an E, how can I get a function that needs, uh, that if I'm given a T, can turn it into an E, if I'm given, if I'm given a T to an S? Can anyone say, how would I, if I could turn a T to an S, how can I turn an a function that takes an S and gives an E into a function that takes a T and gives an E. What can I do? Uh, yeah, just compose it, right? What do I do? I stick the thing that gives a T to F, where do I stick it? Uh, at the beginning, right? So now I have something that just pre-compose it, right? I, I, I take this thing T to F, okay. Um, I can give you an S, I'll stick it here. I, now I can, now I consume a T, that's what I want, up here, um, and I produce an E, that's what I want, right? So what I'm trying to say is, in order to lift a list of S to a list of T, you need something that goes from S to T. In order to lift uh, maybe of S to a maybe of T, you need something that goes from S to T. In order to turn an uh, a function that goes from E to an S to an E to the T, you need something that goes from S to T. Because you have, for all of those, you're going to have a, an X. It's going to be in the list, or it's going to be in the maybe, or it's going to be given to you by this function that takes an E and gives you an X. So you can map it here. You don't have an X. You need an X. It's like you have a negative S. You want an S. You, you, you need an S given to you. So you don't have it to map with something that goes from S to T. It's not like you have one of these and you can turn it into a T. No, no, no. You want it. It's like a hole of a shape S. Like I have this hole that's waiting to get an S, and I can't map that S to a T because I don't have an S. Instead, I need something that will map a T into an S. It, it has a hole type T. It's going to take in a, a T. And then having, having gotten a T, I know how to turn a T into an S. 
and I can plug it into this hole and get that out. Hmm? And, and that's the different model. And in and, and programming, you have to operate with this. You, you, can't, you can't just be operating with things that are covariant going from S to T. We can with this, with maybe and, and, and with uh, things like the Rita functor, but we can't with these guys. Okay. So next time we'll we'll walk through this for a bunch of examples and we'll see some Haskell code, but we'll also see some real sort of daily life examples that illustrate this, where we automatically know there's some daily life. Like it's it's kind of obvious to us. We just don't think about it. It's so clear to us. But in programming, we have to be conscious of that. Sometimes we need a covariant functor, and sometimes we need a contribute. Okay? Um, because sometimes we're dealing with collections that have things, and sometimes we're dealing with things that need to get things, like need to get an S, you know, and then we want something that needs to get a T. And those are different circumstances. Sort of we either have positive things or we have negative things. We have, we have you know, things of, we have the donuts or we have the holes for the donuts, <laughs> right? Um, anyway, that's, that's what we'll see, okay? We go with this? Okay, so take a look at that next chapter, but we're gonna talk about contravariant functors. And uh, I think we'll, we may also touch on one other thing from, from the chapter in terms of the shapes and um, mapping into and out of uh, shapes, which is, is pretty cool. Um, okay. Perfect.